Constitution Act in the 1980s. And he, as I said in the bio, is the only living minister who participated in that constitutional process and is, there, uh, is therefore a unique, let's say, historical and current resource because he can help illuminate Canadians as to the intent of the people who were instrumental in drafting, writing, and agreeing on all of those fundamentally important accords. So let's start by a discuss let's start by talking about what concerns are driving you to re-enter the political discussion at the moment. Well, primarily it is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, especially those freedoms and rights that are in sections two, six, seven, and 15 of the Charter, which I helped craft. And they're freedoms of association, freedoms of expression, religion, conscience, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, that's in section two. Section six, freedom of mobility, the right to travel anywhere in Canada or leave Canada. Section six deals with life, liberty, and the security of the person. And section 15, uh, with equality. Every Canadian is uh, equal before the law. As we sit here today, those, those provisions are being violated by all the governments of Canada, but in particular, in my case right now, the federal government of Canada, and I'm about to launch a lawsuit against the federal government because of these mandates, especially their travel ban. There's no other travel ban in the Western world like this one, and yet we're the second largest country in the world by geography. This impinges upon my right of travel my right to travel to my family back east or my friends. It takes away my right as a Canadian to be protected by the mobility right of Section 6. Okay, and therefore, okay, so I, I feel that the federal government has overreached its authority. Okay, so let me get this clear because I'm still having a hard time conceptualizing the fact that this is actually a reality. So the situation we have in Canada is that a former drafter of what is one of the most fundamental articles of our shared agreement as a people is now about to launch a legal claim against the government itself for violating the fundamental principles upon which the entire country is founded and assembled and agrees. That's not too blunt. No, that is, that is very, very accurate. That's exactly what's happening. I'm the only first minister left alive who was at that conference and helped draft uh, these freedoms and these rights and the Constitution Act of 1982 itself. And I do this very reluctantly. Uh, you know, I've been watching this thing now for almost two years. I've been speaking out about it at public meetings and, and on my blog and so on. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion now that I must, as a Canadian, and as one of the writers and founders of the Constitution Act of 1982, not only speak about it, I must act about it. I must show Canadians that I'm so concerned as a citizen and as a former first minister that helped craft this Constitution Act of 1982, that I must take action against my own government because they have violated rights that I and others helped craft in 1981, 1982. Well, what do you think the legal response to this is going to be? You've obviously, and I know this, of course, is you've been consulting with a legal team, I suppose, and we can talk about that. I mean, it seems to me that this puts the courts in an awfully uh, complicated position, to say the absolute least, because it's, and please correct me if I'm misstepping in any way here, it's up to the courts to determine the letter, but also the spirit of these fundamental laws. And it seems to me that it's almost inarguable that if you have a living member of the, of the body that drafted the provisions, making the claim that they're being violated, that that's as good an indication about the violation of the spirit of the law, certainly, and perhaps the letter as well, that, that, that you could possibly have. It, it, am, I, am I summing that up accurately? Yes, you are. And, and and other lawyers, including the lawyers that will be representing me now in this lawsuit, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, have looked at the situation very carefully. And it's after weeks and weeks of deliberation that we've decided upon this action. So the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms 
will be launching this lawsuit in the next 24 hours or so on behalf of me and a number of other Canadians. But of course, because of my present status and previous status as a first minister, this becomes uh, elevated and, and perhaps more public than it would otherwise become. But th this is my deliberate consideration and that of my lawyers of what is going on in this country. What is happening is that there is a section in Charter of Rights and Freedoms which allows governments to override these freedoms in unusual circumstances. And I remember this very well when we were crafting the, the Constitution. These unusual circumstances, because we're putting it in the Constitution, it's not a federal act or a provincial act. It's in a Constitution which is supposed to enshrine permanent values and give glue to the country. Okay, so this section one can only be used, and I remember this well, in times of peril, in times of war and insurrection, or when the state is in peril, when the existence of the state is in peril. This particular virus, for which there's a recovery of 99%, a fatality rate of less than 1%, does not constitute, in my view, uh, a a situation where the country is in peril. And therefore, I argue that Section 1 doesn't even apply, even though they're trying to make it apply and use that as the reason for doing what they're doing. So you're saying that in your estimation, and, and this is a consequence of the knowledge that you bring forth from conferring with all the people who drafted this legislation to begin with at the provincial and the federal level, that when you drafted it, you did not envision that its provisions could be violated under conditions that weren't a threat, like a fundamental threat to the integrity of the country itself. And, exactly. that, the current, and that the current state of affairs on the public health front does in no way meet that criteria. Absolutely. It does not at all meet that criteria. And e even in the extreme circumstance, because we're all fair people, that you tried to make Section 1 apply. And you, and you said what Peckford and others are saying uh, happened uh, in 81, 82, when Section 1 doesn't apply, uh, does apply. Then there were four tests that had to be met in order for it to apply. That means it must be demonstrably justified uh, that what the action is, is, is worthwhile. In other words, some kind of cost-benefit analysis. It must be done by law. It must be done in reasonable limits. And fourthly, and most importantly, all of those three must be done within the context of a free and democratic society. And a free and democratic society to me means parliamentary democracy in our country. We have 14 parliaments and they have been completely silent. There's no parliamentary committee anywhere in any of those 14 parliaments looking at what's happening to our country. There are the people's representatives. And so- Okay, so you're yeah. also saying, and this is also terrible, that you're also saying that even the process itself by which these exceptions could be made has been essentially subverted in the name of something approximating expediency, but that the, the rationale for that expediency does not indicate a level of seriousness sufficient to justify that expedient process. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. And, and I think that's extremely unfortunate. And uh, I, I only don't really speak for myself on this. There's quite a few experts around. Like the Great Barrington Declaration over a year ago now identified, and these were some of the greatest epidemiologists in the world, how to approach this kind of a situation, okay? And, and that's their principles still stand, you know? You, you, you protect the vulnerable. You do everything to protect the vulnerable in this kind of situation. Uh, and by the way, this is not new. All of the provinces of Canada have what's called emergency measures organizations, which spend, we spend all these millions on as taxpayers who do nothing else, so sit down every day and organize a plan for some kind of an emergency declared, let's say, let's admit maybe a, a, a emergency, or at least a very serious situation in the country. And, and then they bring to, to bear all of the planning tools that are necessary, not just a narrow clinical one from the Department of Health. And right. see whether, how is the best way, and Lieutenant Colonel David Redman out of Alberta, who wrote the new Emergency Measures Act there, uh, speaks eloquently to this and has produced all kinds of documents that nobody has challenged that this was the, the appropriate approach to take. And okay, of so, course, let's, so, so there's two issues that stem out of that. The first is what has also happened, and, and you're making allusion to that, is that the political, our political leaders have not only 
circumvented the parliamentary process to produce provisions that violate the Canadian Charter of Rights, but they've abdicated their responsibility for overall governance, which is the balancing of all sorts of competing interests, to a narrow public, so-called public health policy. So, and that that's also inappropriate governance in the most fundamental sense. Yes, absolutely, no question. And if anybody looks at the documentation that the Lieutenant Colonel David Redmond has produced, they, they will be convinced that the, and, and you know, we had the swine flu and, and other flus before this one, other infectious diseases. And that's why these emergency measures organizations were put in place for, you know, like when the river floods in Winnipeg or when we have, you know, uh, a nice storm in Quebec or whatever, that there are people who have already planned for all of this and have already contacted the private sector, the public sector, all the relevant government departments. So when something happens, they're ready to move quickly on all fronts and have a, a, a very joint effort to ensure that the totality of society is considered- Is compromised. Is not compromised and you put in measures which acknowledge all the factors, because now we know from studies that have been produced even by Douglas, Dr. Douglas Allen of Simon Fraser University, who looked at 80 studies over a year ago, who showed that the cure was worse than the disease. In other words, the lockdowns caused so many problems on the other side that was difficult to justify the measures that were being used. Okay, now you alluded to the fact too that this isn't in some sense common public knowledge and then along with that we're faced with the extreme oddity I would say of the fact that the venue that you chose to announce this move and to discuss all these issues isn't a standard news media venue it's my YouTube channel and one of the things that you discussed with me earlier this week was the impossibility in your view of having these topics dealt with in an honest and straightforward manner by any major news organization in Canada, which to me is almost a uh, statement damning the current larger scale governance structure, which in some sense includes a free press operating in, in a coherent and articulate and trustworthy manner as a check, a check and a, an opportunity for reflection on the political process. And so that in itself seems as worrisome as all the other things that we're talking about at a governmental level. Like, I think this is preposterous in some sense that this is the place where this discussion is taking place. And so... Yes, no, I, 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 I think you raise an extremely important point and one that I need to address. And I've been uh, vocal about being concerned about what's happening for quite some time and have held public meetings here on Vancouver Island and Vancouver in front of the Art Gallery last October. Uh, and I've written letters uh, to national newspapers and they have not carried any of my letters, which is quite unusual because before this happened, they would carry my letters when I made common comment on normal public policy issues across the nation. And they carried my letters. But in recent times, they have not even acknowledged that they received them. And so, so how do you account for that? What, what's going well, on? Well, it seems to me that the media very early on bought into the government narrative and uh, developed the same kind of fear that a lot of individuals did because of what they was being told. All was being pr pr proposed with all these cases, even though these cases didn't represent hospitalizations or ICU visits or whatever. And so there was a fear generated early on and the mainstream media bought into it very quickly and now are out trying to sustain the narrative that they became a part of early on is the only way I can explain it. Of course, we also know that all the mainstream media have received significant sums of money from the government of Canada over the last three years, over $600 million. So one cannot but mention that in any discussion like this, that one has to ask the question, uh, has this flow of money from the federal government to the Canadian press in any way impinged upon their impartiality to tell the story on both sides of the issue? What do you expect is going to happen as a consequence of the challenge that you're mounting? And can you go into some details about the precise nature of the challenge? Because I, I still don't, I don't understand it completely by any yeah. means, and perhaps it's not understandable completely by any means, but you're obviously with your legal team, you have a view of how this is likely to unfold. Um, so 
yes. what do you want to happen yes. and 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 how serious a challenge is this to the claim of the government in some sense to have legitimate sovereignty yes i i i think uh, th this is very serious because i think it, first of all you have to as you know in the legal system specifically articulate in your lawsuit what it is you're you know making the lawsuit about so you have to be specific so we had to pick one area we could have you know freedom of expression conscience assembly association life liberty and so on and we picked mobility and the federal government it itself because this you know is the second largest country in the world right traveling by plane and train is extremely important for business and for the normal functioning of a nation Remember yeah, for the, the maintenance was, of families and for the maintenance of families. The country was formed by moving from east to west with a railway. I mean, our history is all, you know, replete with that kind of stuff. So what we chose was this particular situation of this travel ban, which right impacts every single Canadian in their movement to to meet family and to conduct regular business and so we thought this would be uh, an area that that we should highlight and because we had to get specific so i'm particularly um the lawsuit challenging the the government's program of banning travel by train and plane by canadians in other words we can't travel across our own nation and the section six says mobility the right of every canadian to travel anywhere in canada or leave canada that's what yes. the section says. And that's the exact words of, of section. So therefore, that's what we are pursuing now in the courts in the next couple of days, in the next few weeks, and hopefully we'll get a decision. We're asking for an expedited decision in the next three or four months. So this will fundamentally challenge the approach that the federal government is taking on responding to this so-called pandemic. And therefore, we'll, we'll put into question uh, this whole notion of using Section 1 of the Charter to override these rights and freedoms. If us as First Ministers, uh, Dr. Peterson, had wanted to just have uh, protecting rights and freedoms that could easily be changed, we wouldn't have gone to the Constitution. We would have just said, right. put an act, just put an act in the federal parliament and put acts in all the parliaments, and then uh, up to the whim of the political party at the time to change it. We wanted to safeguard it so that it was beyond the whim of political machinations and therefore could not be changed only in the most extreme circumstances. So what we're really concerned about, and what I'm really concerned about, is if this is not... If our charter is not upheld and then honored, and these freedoms and, and rights honored, then the next, and, and therefore we lose, the next time around when there's an emergency two or three years from now, or one, or the government decides and declares that there is an emergency, they can use this as a precedent, and the charter becomes further diluted, and then our rights and freedoms as individuals has been destroyed, and that section of being a democracy is no more. That is the great danger. And so that's why it's very necessary for me to do what I'm doing. The other point about this is, is that four years after the charter came in, in 1986, there was a case in the Supreme Court of Canada where the judges were forced to look at Section 1 because of the way the lawyer had constructed the case for his client. It's called the Oates Test. And in that, the judges tried to describe what uh, this Section 1 meant. And they did not a bad job, not as good as I thought they should do, but still a much better job. And it's really funny, the lower courts have, who have already looked at the charter as it relates to what's going on, have not used this Oates test, which is highly unusual because courts always look to the precedent set by the highest right. court, Supreme Court, in determining what they will do in their case because they were both concerning the charter. And so the absence of seeing the, uh, the Oates test being used in the lower courts so far is very troubling. And therefore, the other reason why we must take this kind of action at this time. Okay, and so let I'm me ask you a question about that, because this process of so circumventing Parliament and then um, failing to meet the proper standards for the kind of crisis that would involve... Uh, uh, lifting the provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights, um, that should be blocked by the courts if they're abiding by the principle of common law, reliance on 
previous presidents, especially at higher court levels. But that's not happening. And so, and that's in the context that we discussed already, where the media, for example, has become co-opted or corrupted to a degree that it's no longer reliable. I know, I've ta spoken with many lawyers in Canada in recent years who are very upset about the co-option and, and corruption of the entire legal enterprise for similar reasons. Are you even vaguely confident that the, the court system itself has enough integrity to give the views that you're putting forward, even though they're at the basis of the constitution that unites us all? Do you think that your views can get any fairer or more equally impartial hearing in the court system than they have in the media? Well, I, I think here's where I come down on that. The lower courts have made some decisions which are injurious to the, to the charter, and they're being appealed to the higher courts. So I think here's where we have an opportunity. This particular uh, lawsuit of mine will go to the federal court of Canada first, and then it, it, likely to the Supreme Court of Canada second, regardless of what decision is made, one side or the other will, will quite likely appeal it. Uh, so I think at the court of appeal in the provinces, that's the highest courts in the provinces, every single province has courts, a Supreme Court, and then a court of appeal. And Canadians are confused about that because when they hear of these early decisions, they think that's the end of it. And that's only the beginning of it. To use a really good the metaphor, Canadian metaphor, we're in the second period, halfway through the second period. We still got a, a, you know, perhaps half the game left or almost half the game left. And that's where the courts of appeal come in, who usually are more independent and more sober thought as it relates to the jurisprudence, which is before them. And so this is where I and, and the lawyers, I think, uh, come down and say, we have to exhaust all of the civilized legal processes that we set up under our constitution. And that means these decisions will be appealed to the courts of appeal in the provinces and then to the Supreme Court of Canada. So it's these higher courts that have an unbelievable responsibility now on elected judges yeah. to finally decide whether in fact uh, the, the really the democracy of Canada is going to survive or not, or whether suddenly from 1867 to 1981, 82, we didn't have a written charter, we get one, and now within 40 years, it's being eviscerated or somehow um, undermined by an overreach of the various governments. That's our position, and we hope to put that to the judge, judges, and hopefully that the judges will see it in that kind of reasoned, balanced way. Okay, so you focused on uh, movement, the right to movement. And I, I think you put that in a very interesting historical context and practical context with your discussion of the fact, A, that Canada is absolutely huge and people are distributed all across it and that freedom of movement is necessary for us to conduct our businesses and to maintain our families and to communicate, but also that Canada itself was knitted together as a consequence of facilitation of freedom of movement, not least by the railway. So, but were there other violations of charter principles that you considered um, highlighting as you moved forward before you settled on freedom of movement? Of course, there are many, including freedom of association and freedom of assembly. Lots of people, the churches, Christian churches and other churches were, were prevented from getting together. So that violated. Yeah, and there's a curfew assembly. in Quebec yes. still, which yes. is just it's just absolutely beyond comprehension, in my uh, estimation, in a free society uh, that that can be the case. And I have friends in Quebec who are hurt to the bone by the fact, for example, that they're not allowed, given their. They're not allowed to attend religious services, for example, which, and that's a really egregious violation because if there's anything more fundamental, let's say, than freedom of association, well, maybe there's freedom of speech, but before that even, there's freedom of belief. And and to, to interfere with that at a governmental level is unprecedented, in my estimation. Especially when they have not gone out of their way to demonstrably justify, which is one of the tests of, of Section 1. Where is the demonstrably justification, demonstrable justification of what they're doing? One would think in public policy since my time, and long before when I was a premier, one of the things governments did when they were introducing, especially brand new legislation 
you know, and doing very serious things with the Constitution would be to do a cost-benefit analysis. And based upon that, you would decide how you went forward. None of that was done. No parliamentary committee was ever struck to look at both sides of the issue and call in experts. All of these kinds of reasonable measures, which were part of the Canadian fabric of developing public policy, have been discarded in this particular... Uh, so what are people... Okay, so what are people doing... I've spoken to Rex Murphy about that, and Rex has been the only journalist, perhaps, who's been beating the warning drum, trying to alert Canadians to the fact that the parliamentary process itself has been subverted at the federal yeah. and the provincial levels. And he's, he's certainly been allowed to express those views, but I don't think Canadians have any real sense of exactly how serious that is. So th one question would be, well, if our laws are no longer, if the laws that restrict our charter freedoms are no longer being produced by parliamentary debate, how are they being produced? And so that'd be the first question. How practically, how is this occurring? Is it just by, is it just by fiat? Is it just by statement? And, and, and if so, why are these laws to be regarded as valid at all? And if they're not valid, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, here, here's where the most insidious part of this equation comes into play. What the governments have done have used, in very many cases, existing legislation under which they have the power to make regulation. So they've used existing emergencies, okay, legislation, and uh, inflated it enough or interpreted it in a manner that they could also use in this circumstance and therefore issue additional uh, uh, regulation. OK, and then in other cases, they did not fully explain or have a parliamentary committee look at other amendments when they opened their parliament and closed it within two or three days or a week. In other words, sufficient debate wasn't allowed to, to understand the repercussions of what they were doing when they were giving more power to the minister and more power to the public health officer. Right. This so this really means this really means in some sense that none of these policies were subject to opposition. Which exactly. because that's and so and let's we could delve into that a little bit. You might say, well, in an emergency such that provisions shouldn't be subject to opposition because that's inefficient. But that is the same thing as saying two things. One is that they shouldn't be thought about because discussion between opposing parties is actually thought. And then the second thing it's saying is they should be implemented without recourse to the broader public because the broader public is represented in that oppositional structure so that everybody's voices are being allowed to, to be heard. That's what that's in some sense yeah. the whole point of the parliament where you parliament means place of talking fundamentally and it means more deeply than that place of thinking and even more deeply than that place of discussion of the entire panoply of public opinion. That's all gone by the wayside in the name of efficiency, let's say, or something like that. Yes, doctor, and even it gets worse than that because we have had time. One can perhaps relieve or excuse if one wants to, to make a, so that your argument is completely reasonable and say, for the first 90 days yeah. when this thing began, you could make an argument that, okay, the governments had to move. But in any rational way, if they had used the emergency measures planning that was already in place, they would have moved to protect the vulnerable first and then did a study on the rest. What else? do we need to do in society? What they did is just a carte blanche on or over all of society without giving second thought to it. And now all of the studies, 90 days after this started, and 100 days, 120 days, uh, show, right? And then the Great Barrington Declaration is a good example. Over a year old now is the Great Barrington Declaration. So they had lots of information. And Dr. Allen's report from Simon and Fraser over a year ago. So they've had lots of uh, information and scientific studies about what's going on to demonstrate that not only are the vaccines destructive, more destructive than any vaccines in our history, and that's a, that's a scientific fact, uh, then uh, they had time to adjust. And this is where they have not even been nimble in this kind of circumstance when you think this is the very time that governments will be nimble. Okay, we'll, we'll see what we can do with the vulnerable, all these long care, care homes and the hospitals and those who are most vulnerable. And we'll now have the parliamentary committee on an expedited basis. I understand that. 
on an emergency basis, bring in experts from both sides within the next 30 days to see whether what else we should do in a reasonable and graduated way or are what we're doing now the most appropriate way to respond to right. it. That, right. So your, None of that your, was done. So your case is, well, in the early stages of the emergency of the of the pandemic, when people didn't understand the magnitude of the risk, there was potential for justification for reducing parliamentary complexity to um, short term efficiency. But as the pandemic has unfolded and we become more aware of its true risks or lack thereof, we should have returned to the principles of parliamentary democracy as rapidly as possible. And with less and less justification, that's continued to happen. That that circumvention of the parliamentary process has continued to happen. And and I suppose that culminated in, in recent months with the Quebec, the Quebec lockdown, the, the curfew. I don't see how anybody can possibly make the case that that curfew was implemented under conditions that were as uncertain and dire as those that obtained in the initial phases of the pandemic, especially given that Omicron is obviously much less serious than the original virus. And also we We've already attained something approximately an, something approximating an 80% vaccination rate, and that's not going to be pushed up much higher than 90% without government intervention that becomes unbelievably heavy-handed. So there's less and less justification for more and more circumvention of parliamentary processes as this proceeds instead of exactly the opposite. Exactly. And that's why uh, it took me this long to to be convinced that I had to take this action. I mean, I never took this action 90 days after they brought in these things or 100 days or a year after. Right. We've I've been watching this and, and commenting and making, you know, articulating my concerns as Rex has. By the way, Rex and Murphy and I went to university together. We're both uh, Newfoundlanders. We're all both born in Newfoundland. And uh, I, I've heard him on your program with you and enjoy enjoy the conversation and, and uh, love the English literature and the classics like like he does and um, we both got a, a very wonderful education at memorial in those days it's no longer there now but we did and, and i do appreciate his commentary and what he's brought to this uh, to this discussion it's very very important but the uh, the other thing is as you say the, the transmission of the of the virus now and the virus has changed so a lot of the vaccines that are being used are no longer applicable they don't do anything uh, to the existing variant that we have. They were devised for another variant or for the original virus. And the other thing is people getting aboard planes and my, and my travel ban that I'm arguing on before the lawsuit is that everybody transmits it now, unvaccinated and vaccinated, transmit, receive and transmit the virus. So it's hard to make the argument that the travel ban should be in place if the transmission of the virus for which all of this is centered is no longer valid. That is, is that the vaccinated protect uh, against the virus because they receive it and transmit it the same as the unvaccinated. And now we find in Denmark, Israel, just in the last few days, right, that the, and Australia, their case rates have gone to the roof again, even though they're 90 percent vaccinated. And so the whole basis, right, the whole basis of this uh, argument of these lockdowns and travel bans and so on, the, the basis is crumble, right? The whole citadel on which this so-called rational approach to a virus has completely crumbled and no, no longer can sustain itself. So it, it, one must then question why is this continuing to be in place when all of that data is available, which at least... Well, I can tell you what I've been informed of. 